Trying to define yourself is like trying to bite your own teeth. Man suffers only because he takes seriously what the gods made for fun. We seldom realize, for example that our most private thoughts and emotions are not actually our own. For we think in terms of languages and images which we did not invent, but which were given to us by our society. The meaning of life is just to be alive. It is so plain and so obvious and so simple. And yet, everybody rushes around in a great panic as if it were necessary to achieve something beyond themselves. This is the real secret of life, to be completely engaged with what you are doing in the here and now. And instead of calling it work, realize it is play. Advice? I don't have advice. Stop aspiring and start writing. If you're writing, you're a writer. Write like you're a goddamn death row inmate and the governor is out of the country and there's no chance for a pardon. Write like you're clinging to the edge of a cliff, white knuckles, on your last breath, and you've got just one last thing to say. Like you're a bird flying over us and you can see everything, and please, for God's sake, tell us something that will save us from ourselves. Take a deep breath and tell us your deepest, darkest secret, so we can wipe our brow and know that we're not alone. Write like you have a message from the king. Or don't. Who knows? Maybe you're one of the lucky ones who doesn't have to. To have faith is to trust yourself to the water. When you swim you don't grab hold of the water, because if you do you will sink and drown. Instead you relax, and float. The only way to make sense out of change is to plunge into it, move with it, and join the dance. You are an aperture through which the universe is looking at and exploring itself. The menu is not the meal. You are a function of what the whole universe is doing in the same way that a wave is a function of what the whole ocean is doing. Through our eyes, the universe is perceiving itself. Through our ears, the universe is listening to its harmonies. We are the witnesses through which the universe becomes conscious of its glory, of its magnificence. I have realized that the past and future are real illusions, that they exist in the present, which is what there is and all there is. The more a thing tends to be permanent, the more it tends to be lifeless. Jesus Christ knew he was God. So wake up and find out eventually who you really are. In our culture, of course, they'll say you're crazy and you're blasphemous, and they'll either put you in jail or in a nut house, which is pretty much the same thing. However if you wake up in India and tell your friends and relations. My goodness, I've just discovered that I'm God, they'll laugh and say, oh, congratulations, at last you found out. We are living in a culture entirely hypnotized by the illusion of time, in which the so-called present moment is felt as nothing but an infinitesimal hairline between an all-powerfully causative past, and an absorbingly important future. We have no present. Our consciousness is almost completely preoccupied with memory and expectation. We do not realize that there never was, is, nor will be any other experience than present experience. We are therefore out of touch with reality. We confuse the world as talked about, described, and measured with the world which actually is. We are sick with a fascination for the useful tools of names and numbers, of symbols, signs, conceptions, and ideas. The art of living is neither careless drifting on the one hand nor fearful clinging to the past on the other. It consists in being sensitive to each moment, in regarding it as utterly new and unique, in having the mind open and wholly receptive. Try to imagine what it will be like to go to sleep and never wake up, now try to imagine what it was like to wake up having never gone to sleep. Problems that remain persistently insoluble should always be suspected as questions asked in the wrong way. Things are as they are. Looking out into the universe at night, we make no comparisons between right and wrong stars, 
nor between well and badly arranged constellations. Tomorrow and plans for tomorrow can have no significance at all unless you are in full contact with the reality of the present, since it is in the present and only in the present that you live. There is no other reality than present reality, so that, even if one were to live for endless ages, to live for the future would be to miss the point everlastingly. A scholar tries to learn something every day. A student of Buddhism tries to unlearn something daily. We do not come into this world, we come out of it, as leaves from a tree. As the ocean waves, the universe peoples. Every individual is an expression of the whole realm of nature, a unique action of the total universe. It's like you took a bottle of ink and you threw it at a wall. Smash! And all that ink spread. And in the middle, it's dense, isn't it? And as it gets out on the edge, the little droplets get finer and finer and make more complicated patterns, see? So in the same way, there was a big bang at the beginning of things and it spread. And you and I, sitting here in this room, as complicated human beings, are way, way out on the fringe of that bang. We are the complicated little patterns on the end of it. Very interesting. But so we define ourselves as being only that. If you think that you are only inside your skin, you define yourself as one very complicated little curlique, way out on the edge of that explosion. Way out in space, and way out in time. Billions of years ago, you were a big bang, but now you are a complicated human being. And then we cut ourselves off, and don't feel that we're still the big bang. But you are. Depends how you define yourself. You are actually if this is the way things started, if there was a big bang in the beginning, you're not something that's a result of the big bang. You're not something that is a sort of puppet on the end of the process. You are still the process. You are the big bang, the original force of the universe, coming on as whoever you are. When I meet you, I see not just what you define yourself as Mr. So and so, Ms. So and so, Mrs. So and so, I see every one of you as the primordial energy of the universe coming on at me in this particular way. I know I'm that, too. But we've learned to define ourselves as separate from it. Every intelligent individual wants to know what makes him tick and yet is at once fascinated and frustrated by the fact that oneself is the most difficult of all things to know. Life is like music for its own sake. We are living in an eternal now, and when we listen to music we are not listening to the past, we are not listening to the future, we are listening to an expanded present. When we attempt to exercise power or control over someone else, we cannot avoid giving that person the very same power or control over us. What we have forgotten is that thoughts and words are conventions, and that it is fatal to take conventions too seriously. A convention is a social convenience, as, for example, money, but it is absurd to take money too seriously. To confuse it with real wealth. In somewhat the same way, Thoughts, ideas, and words are coins for real things. Never pretend to a love which you do not actually feel, for love is not ours to command. Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream that you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would, Naturally as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have every kind of pleasure you could conceive. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Where something is gonna happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a close shave, wasn't it? 
And then you would get more and more adventurous, and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream, where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. Zen does not confuse spirituality with thinking about God while one is peeling potatoes. Zen spirituality is just to peel the potatoes. If you say that getting the money is the most important thing, you'll spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living, that is to go on doing things you don't like doing, which is stupid. To remain stable is to refrain from trying to separate yourself from a pain because you know that you cannot. Running away from fear is fear, fighting pain is pain, trying to be brave is being scared. If the mind is in pain, the mind is pain. The thinker has no other form than his thought. There is no escape. One is a great deal less anxious if one feels perfectly free to be anxious. And the same may be said of guilt. And people get all fouled up because they want the world to have meaning as if it were words. As if you had a meaning, as if you were a mere word, as if you were something that could be looked up in a dictionary. You are meaning. If we cling to belief in God, we cannot likewise have faith, since faith is not clinging but letting go. You and I are all as much continuous with the physical universe as a wave is continuous with the ocean. How is it possible that a being with such sensitive jewels as the eyes, such enchanted musical instruments as the ears, and such fabulous arabesque of nerves as the brain can experience itself anything less than a god? To put it still more plainly, the desire for security and the feeling of insecurity are the same thing. To hold your breath is to lose your breath. A society based on the quest for security is nothing but a breath retention contest in which everyone is as taut as a drum, and as purple as a beat. A priest once quoted to me the Roman saying that a religion is dead when the priests laugh at each other across the altar. I always laugh at the altar, be it Christian, Hindu, or Buddhist, because real religion is the transformation of anxiety into laughter. What I am really saying is that you don't need to do anything, because if you see yourself in the correct way, you are all as much extraordinary phenomenon of nature as trees, clouds, the patterns in running water, the flickering of fire, the arrangement of the stars, and the form of a galaxy. You are all just like that, and there is nothing wrong with you at all. But I'll tell you what hermits realize. If you go off into a far, far forest and get very quiet, you'll come to understand that you're connected with everything. Other people teach us who we are. Their attitudes to us are the mirror in which we learn to see ourselves. But the mirror is distorted. We are perhaps, rather dimly aware of the immense power of our social environment. We seldom realize, for example, that our most private thoughts and emotions are not actually our own. For we think in terms of languages and images which we did not invent, but which were given to us by our society. We copy emotional reactions from our parents. Learning from them that excrement is supposed to have a disgusting smell and that vomiting is supposed to be an unpleasant sensation. The dread of death is also learned from their anxieties about sickness and from their attitudes to funerals and corpses. Our social environment has this power just because we do not exist apart from a society. Society is our extended mind and body. Yet the very society from which the individual is inseparable is using its whole irresistible force to persuade the individual that he is indeed separate. Society as we now know it is therefore playing a game with self-contradictory rules, the world is filled with love play, from animal lust to sublime compassion. So then, the relationship of self to other is the complete realization that loving yourself is impossible without loving everything defined as other than yourself. We could say that meditation doesn't have a reason or doesn't have a purpose. 
In this respect it's unlike almost all other things we do except perhaps making music and dancing. When we make music we don't do it in order to reach a certain point, such as the end of the composition. If that were the purpose of music then obviously the fastest players would be the best. Also, when we are dancing we are not aiming to arrive at a particular place on the floor as in a journey. When we dance, the journey itself is the point, as when we play music the playing itself is the point. And exactly the same thing is true in meditation. Meditation is the discovery that the point of life is always arrived at in the immediate moment. Irrevocable commitment to any religion is not only intellectual suicide, it is positive unfaith because it closes the mind to any new vision of the world. Faith is, above all, openness, an act of trust in the unknown. You are under no obligation to be the same person you were five minutes ago. What we have to discover is that there is no safety, that seeking is painful, and that when we imagine that we have found it, we don't like it. There is nothing at all that can be talked about adequately, and the whole art of poetry is to say what can't be said. This, then, is the human problem, there is a price to be paid for every increase in consciousness. We cannot be more sensitive to pleasure without being more sensitive to pain. By remembering the past we can plan for the future. But the ability to plan for the future is offset by the ability to dread pain and to fear of the unknown. Furthermore, the growth of an acute sense of the past and future gives us a corresponding dim sense of the present. In other words, we seem to reach a point where the advantages of being conscious are outweighed by its disadvantages. Where extreme sensitivity makes us unadaptable. Real travel requires a maximum of unscheduled wandering, for there is no other way of discovering surprises and marvels, which, as I see it, is the only good reason for not staying at home. If, then, my awareness of the past and future makes me less aware of the present, I must begin to wonder whether I am actually living in the real world. Really, the fundamental, ultimate mystery, the only thing you need to know to understand the deepest metaphysical secrets, is this, that for every outside there is an inside and for every inside there is an outside, and although they are different, they go together. Paradoxical as it may seem. The purposeful life has no content, no point. It hurries on and on, and misses everything. Not hurrying, the purposeless life misses nothing, for it is only when there is no goal and no rush that the human senses are fully open to receive the world. For unless one is able to live fully in the present, the future is a hoax. There is no point whatever in making plans for a future which you will never be able to enjoy. When your plans mature, you will still be living for some other future beyond. You will never, never be able to sit back with full contentment and say, now, I've arrived. Your entire education has deprived you of this capacity because it was preparing you for the future. Instead of showing you how to be alive now, if you cannot trust yourself, you cannot even trust your mistrust of yourself, so that without this underlying trust in the whole system of nature you are simply paralyzed. Words can be communicative only between those who share similar experiences.